I'm going to present a different aspect of the spectrum and more of a clinical situation um, in my experience with mycoplasma hyosinovia, um, resulting in lameness and grow finish population, specifically our replacement gilts. Um, so to start off with, we'll talk a little bit about the background, but Luis has already done a really good job of that. Um, talk a little, uh, dive into a case study, um, focusing on one of the sow farms in particular in our in our system, looking at the prevalence and clinical signs, um, and try to correlate some production data with that to give you some numbers and perspective. Um, and then finally, we'll end with our a control strategy that seems to be working for our particular situation and the results we've seen, and then we'll close with some final thoughts. So as Luisa already talked about, um, as veterinarians, we come up with a list of dif differential diagnoses for any problem we encounter. Um, both infectious and non-infectious. So the first three you can see here would be non-infectious, um, and then the final five would be infectious causes. Some of these are obviously a little more difficult to rule out than others, um, but that's why we take diagnostics and take a science-based approach to try to eliminate as many of those as possible until we can arrive at a final conclusion. So specifically today we'll be talking about the, the fourth point here, mycoplasma hyosinovia. And Louisa did a much better job at explaining this than I will, but mycoplasma hyosinovia is a ubiquitous organism. Um, it's found across the systems across the country and the globe. Um, there is a wide range of clinical expression, anywhere from subacute to chronic and um, severely lame animals. So it all starts with colonization in the upper respiratory tract, specifically the tonsil. Um, that occurs anywhere from four to eight weeks of age, and that incubation phase will last a minimum of four days. Uh, the next stage would be the acute phase, which lasts one to two weeks, and that's where the organism locates to the joint and tissues. And ultimately, that will result in what we commonly term arthritis or um, lameness, and that, that's our subacute or chronic phase, which occurs three to 16 weeks post-exposure. So if we look at trying to find a case definition for mycoplasma hyosinovia, this was about the best I could find. Um, Dr. Gomez has a nice table here summarizing how to diagnose my mycoplasma-associated arthritis. And what I've highlighted here is that a complete diagnosis of myco-associated arthritis requires both the presence of microscopic lesions as well as identification of the organism and infected tissue. So number one, we've got to have clinically lame animals. Um, second of all, we've got to have detection of the organism in joint fluid. And then finally, we want to have synovial tissue histolesions. Um, the research would suggest that there's a, de a similar detection rate amongst uh, both the hock and stifle joints. So that's uh, just something to keep in mind when you are taking diagnostics and working up a mycoarthritis case. Iowa State says on their website they prefer joint fluid to joint swabs and tissues or synovium. Usually what I do is just submit a whole leg intact and let the, the diagnosticians do the hard work for me. Um, another more recent test would be the oral fluid PCR. Um, so since this organism does con uh, colonize the upper respiratory tract and the tonsil, um, it comes as no surprise that nasal and pharyngeal secretions would contain the organism. Um, but the caveat there is that healthy pigs can also have uh, positive oral fluids. So just because we're able to detect it on PCR doesn't necessarily correlate with the clinical picture that we're seeing in those animals. So it's a highly sensitive test, as most PCRs are. Um, colonization doesn't always equal infection, and detection does not equal uh, clinical expression. And then here at the bottom, I've kind of summarized the uh, pathogenesis of the organism. So it starts in the tonsil, and then for some reason that we don't quite understand yet, um, we always attribute it to stress or some kind of predisposing cofactors. Um, results in that organism being spread throughout the system, localizing to the joints and resulting in arthritis. So now I'll dive into a case study. Um, I'll term the farm B. Um, it would be one of our 6,400 head sow farms, um, breed to wean site, PERS and PED negative. Uh, they are flu and myco vaccinated and stable. Uh, they receive replacement gilts every four weeks from an internal multiplier PIC genetics farm. The gilts are three weeks of age at entry, 
and they're vaccinated for circo and ileitis at the multiplier, and then on arrival they get their uh, mycoplasma vaccine. They come in groups of 325 head, and we usually call them lots, and they arrive into an isolation that is on site and attached, and the diagram here kind of illustrates the layout. It's got two rooms, um, there are plastic floors, and the gilts, the two groups of gilts would uh, remain in isolation for a total of eight weeks. Once we've tested them clear of PERS and PED, they're moved into the adjacent on-site grower GDU. And in the time in the nursery, or in the isolation, they receive um, four different diets. So after they're tested negative and cleared, we move them into the attached grower and GDU. And so you can see here, this is a, the barn runs north to south. On the west side would be what we call the grower, and then on the east side would be the finisher. They're separated by a wall, and um, there's two alleyways that run along the wall on each side. So um, looking at the grower, which would be the west side, we've it's divided up into 18 pens of three different sizes. So there's six sizes of each pen. Um, and then at the north end of the barn would be an additional hospital pen, and that's the, the, the end that the fans are located on. It is a tunnel ventilated barn, and then on the south side would be the curtains. Um, so the, the grower side will hold three lots or 12 weeks worth of gilts. Um, they are on two different rations during that time, and they're in static pens once they enter the grower. And then once they complete that 12 weeks, they move over to the finisher side, which is on the east side. Uh, this farm is an ESF farm, so they go through their electronic sow feeding training stations um, for a period of four weeks. Um, there are 10 pens on that side, uh, holding two different lots of gilts or eight weeks worth of gilts. Um, and then again, at the north end of the building would be a pen for non-selects and a pen for um, hospital treatments. And they've also got two diets while they're on that side. So clinical expression, in my experience at this farm, has been hind limb lameness with or without joint swelling and pain resulting in gait alteration. Uh, the period of onset that we typically see the clinical expression is about 14 to 15 weeks of age. Um, recall, once they, they enter the farm at three weeks of age and they spend about eight weeks in isolation, so when they enter the grower GDU, they're about 11 to 12 weeks of age. Um, it's anywhere from a 1 to 10 percent prevalence, and I quantify this monthly during my uh, routine herd visits. Uh, this would just be an example of a, a herd visit form that I would fill out. Uh, to try to quantify the number of, of lame animals in each group. And the clinical spectrum is across the board, anywhere from what we would call a score of zero to a score of three. Um, so the clinically unaffected or subclinical carriers, as well as the slow animals reluctant to rise, and then what we would um, term do dog sitters, the ones that are down with muscular tremors, and you really have to work at it to get them uh, to want to stand up. Uh, so when I do my on-farm education of trying to train uh, the farm manager and the, the department manager on how to recognize lameness, I usually go back to fall back to the Zen Pro scoring system. Um, I think it's a pretty standard system used throughout the industry and probably aligns with uh, the one that uh, Louisa referenced in her talk. So you can see a, a score of zero would be an animal that is clinically not lame at all. Um, a score of one, you know, she's a little little more difficult to move. Um, and then if you get up into the scores of two and three, they're, they're really reluctant to rise and not wanting to move around very much. Uh, tissue diagnostics that I've gotten from this farm, uh, there's been multiple submissions that I've made, but this is just one of the examples that I pulled. So the presentation was a gilt that was 14 weeks of age with severe bilateral hind limb name, lameness, or what we would call a dog sitter. Um, she was euthanized and submitted two intact hind limbs um, to Iowa State. Histopath results on that came back as lymphoplasmacytic synovitis, um, and they were able to detect myco on um, the joint fluid PCR. Uh, they were not able to culture anything, and I can't recall if this animal had been treated or not before. I know the cardinal rule of sending in diagnostics is to um, try to pick one that's not been treated, but sometimes that's difficult. Um, so ultimately, the diagnosis here would have been mycoplasmal arthritis. 
And this is kind of a messy chart, I apologize for that, but uh, this would be an oral fluid GDU cross-sectional that we, we performed across five of our different uh, sow farms. Um, and so I've just got, got them labeled here as A, B, C, D, and E um, on the left-hand side. Farm B would be the particular farm that I've been describing in the case study. Um, and then the, the little symbols next to them just indicate the, uh, the multiplier source. So you can see here farms A and B share the same source farm. Um, farm C had, had shared that farm but then switched sources. And then farms D and E also share a similar source farm. So whether or not genetics has any role, I haven't actually dived into that to um, investigate that further. But I want to make that um, available here for anyone who would be interested in, in that. Uh, the next column would be the lot or the group number, which is uh, the birth week of those animals. And in parentheses, I've got whether or not their, their oral fluids were positive or negative for mycoplasma hyosinovia. And so in the center are the results. And I've also included the CT value in the following column. Uh, but the moral of the story here is that anywhere from 10 to 30 weeks of age, we're, to, we're able to detect mycoplasma um, hyosinovi on oral fluid PCR. Um, and as Louisa was talking about before, um, the correlation with the clinical lameness is not always black and white. So just because they're positive on PCR doesn't necessarily mean that they're clinically lame and vice versa. This was a study performed by our um, Innovative Swine Solutions team. Um, they provided this to me, and across the bottom on the x-axis would be weeks post-placement. On the y-axis would be the number of new treatments. So here we're looking at the number of new lameness treatments by week post-placement um, in the grower. So these animals would be coming in as wean pigs at three weeks of age. Um, and this is actually a downstream flow from farm B. So um, it's a little bit messy, but you can kind of see the trend of new lameness treats starts to increase around that 8 to 10 weeks post-placement, which would be, you know, in that time frame that I've been describing um, at 14 to 15 weeks of age when we're starting to see the clinical lameness really increase. If we try to pull production data and kind of overlap it, it gets a little messy because uh, we can't really specify what the cause of lameness is. All we know is that those animals were either um, found or they contributed to the mortality or they contributed to the, the culling. And so uh, the next few slides I've got here uh, look at guilt mortality, sow mortality, and sow culling by parity and reason or by age and reason. Um, so farm B guilt production impact. This will show the guilt group mortality by reason and age. So across the top, we've got the reason for mortality. And I've got lameness highlighted in red. And then on the, the left-hand side would be the number of days post-placement. Uh, so lameness would account for 43% of the guilt group mortality over the past 12 months, which is um, the length of time that this data accounts for. So 43% of guilt mortality over the past 12 months have been attributed to lameness. Um, if we put some more numbers with that, so we've got 12 months worth of gilts, and each month we receive 325 gilts, so that would be a total of 3,900 animals. And you're looking at 43 uh, mortalities over that number of animals would account for about 1% of your starting inventory um, that is dying due to lameness. So the numbers start to add up. If we, you know, follow those gilts downstream or through their, their life uh, productivity and look at sow mortality, um, here we can see that parity is across the top and that removal reason or reason for death would be down across or on the left-hand side. So I've highlighted lameness here and I've highlighted parity zero, zero and one um, since they would uh, you would assume those to have uh, potentially the highest uh, levels of mycoplasma hyosinovia. Um, and so down here at the bottom, lameness accounts for 19 and 13 percent, respectively, of gilts and P1's mortality. If we look at reasons for culling, so reasons that we send animals off the farm, um, lameness accounts for 12 percent in 
P0s and P1s, and across the board lameness would be the number one reason that animals would be culled from the farms in our system. So mitigation strategies that we've found to be effective, um, I can kind of break this down into three different um, areas of control. The first one being identifying the period of onset. Uh, the second one would be acclimation or endemic pathogen exposure. And lastly, um, applying strategic treatment. And again, this is a pretty general control strategy. It could apply to multiple organisms, but here I've applied it to mycoplasma. So if we break it down into the first one, um, we've already identified our period of onset. And again, this is for our particular farm and our particular system. It may, not, it may be different than what you see in your own farm, but 14 to 15 weeks of age seems to be that period of onset. So three to four weeks post-placement into the grower out of isolation is when we're seeing that increase. Um, early identification of those animals that are lame is really, really important. That's key to minimizing the performance losses and um, seeing those mortality and culling numbers increase. Um, as I mentioned before, on-farm education is also very critical to getting ahead of lameness and, and preventing the downstream losses. So walking through the pens with those managers every time you're on the farm, um, getting all the animals up, looking for those subtle clinical signs of lameness um, is really important uh, to getting ahead of the problem. Um, so every time I'm on the farm, I do walk through all the pens with the, the department manager, or the farm manager, as well as the production manager. Uh, we identify animals that are uh, lame, down, um, not wanting to get up. We treat those animals usually with an antibiotic and an anti-inflammatory. Um, and if they're severe enough, we'll pull them to the hospital pen for um, more specialized treatment. Um, but month after month, I've seen this control strategy that I'm describing and will continue to describe really help decrease the prevalence and the incidence of um, lameness. The second step would be um, acclimating our gilts and making sure we're getting early exposure. So um, it's difficult in this particular farm because it has plastic floors in isolation, so we can't necessarily roll back gilts um, onto those plastic floors. But we do have other farms that have three-room isolations with the concrete slats that it's a lot easier to um, manage that strategy. So the compromise we made in this situation is that once those gilts come in from isolation into the grower, uh, for the first seven days after they're, they're placed in there, we will run um, non-select gilts in the alleyways um, right there along that wall dividing the grower and the GDU. Um, and, and the hopes there is to get nose-to-nose -nose contact to try to um, expose them to any kind of endemic pathogens, um, mycoplasma hyosinovia and beyond, just to try to get that early exposure and... Um, um, help reduce lameness. And then the third control step, which, um, you know, it's been described across the industry and everyone's got their own little things they like to do, but we found that if we get ahead of the onset uh, with a five-day course of Linko at this particular farm, uh, that it really cuts down significantly on the number of um, animals that we find lame and the numbers that we're having to injectably treat. So at three weeks into the grower, we'll run five days of Linko. Um, they would be about 14, 13 or 14 weeks of age at that time. Um, I've gone so far to put it on their guilt vaccination and testing schedules so that it's something they have to check off their list routinely um, so they don't forget it and it gets done. Uh, because we found that if we do skip groups, that those groups tend to be the ones with the higher uh, incidence and, and prevalence of lameness down, down the line. Another measure we've taken to try to be better stewards of antibiotic use is to install um, lot-specific water medicators. So that cuts down on our antibiotic use by two-thirds. Um, we, can, we can target treat individual groups and not have to treat all three of them on that grower side at the same time. Um, and so... Um, that's one of, the, one of the other steps that we've taken. And we continue to treat with injectable linko and pre-def throughout this whole time, um, but obviously the number that we're having to treat in that manner is, is much less. And so I don't have any actual numbers to give you, but I, I would say that through my monthly visits that it significantly reduce uh, the prevalence of lameness and the severity and duration of the lameness that we um, experience at this particular farm.
And again, what we what works for our system may or may not work for yours. So um, hopefully this process has kind of given you something to think about and how to approach the, the problem, how to identify that period of onset, and then what you can do, different strategies you can use to uh, try to acclimate those guilts and get them recovered quicker. Um, other options that are out there, and I guess this would be more of a research um, experimental uh, point, would be an autogenous vaccine. Um, again, with mycoplasma, it's a little difficult to um, get good isolation and a good culture on that organism, so that presents some challenges. Um, another research project we've got coming up, since we do have the lot-specific medicators, is um, working with a pharmaceutical company to try a different product. Um, and determine the, the best timing um, for that water-soluble antibiotic uh, to try to reduce the incident, incidence and severity of lameness. So that's, that's some of the other things that we've got coming up. But um, as everyone has suggested here, I think we, we really just don't understand this organism well enough at this point, and hopefully we can make some strides when we come back next year, have something better to talk about.